The Buddha describes four factors for stream entry, the first taste of awakening. And when you look at the list, you realize that the basic factors for any serious practice. And so whether you're aiming at stream entry or not, it's good to know these factors because they underlie all the practice, any kind of practice where you want to get results. The first factor is associating with people of integrity. How do you recognize people of integrity? The Buddha gives a couple of tests. One is that it requires that you be with that person for a while, so you get to see the person in action. And you ask two questions. Notice, would you ever say, would you ever tell anyone to do something that would not be in that person's best interest? And two, would you ever claim to not know things that he doesn't really know? If the person passes the test, this may be a person of integrity. Because another quality is you have to have some integrity yourself in order to recognize it in other people. This is why the Buddha sent his prerequisites for a student, someone who is truthful and observant. You try to be observant both of yourself and of the teacher, and you try to be truthful to yourself and to the teacher. Because whatever is coming up in your mind, whatever problems you have, you're not embarrassed to talk about them. And you don't claim things that you haven't attained. So having some integrity is a basis for recognizing it in other people. That old principle that crooked people can't recognize people are honest because they're assuming everybody's crooked. That takes someone who's honest to get a sense of who's honest out there. Once you find someone of integrity, then you listen to the true drama from that person. And again, the Buddha gets some tests for recognizing true dharma. The most important was, when you put it into practice, what kind of qualities does it give rise to in the mind? Does it give rise to greed, aversion, and delusion? And then there's something wrong. If it makes you difficult to maintain, if it makes you burdensome on other people, that's something wrong. You look for a dharma that gives you good reasons to behave in skillful ways. And then we've heard the dharma, then the next factor is appropriate attention. This is where you have to put a lot into it. Appropriate attention means basically looking at things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, seeing how whatever teaching you've learned from the Dharma applies to the problem of suffering in your life. Where are you suffering? And what are you doing to cause that suffering? Notice that's the question. What are you doing? And we don't blame the suffering on things outside or people outside. We look for it within ourselves. We look for the cause within ourselves. Then we figure out what we can do to practice so we can then abandon the cause. That's always the question you should bring to any particular teaching. How does this apply to understanding suffering and putting an end to it? As a passage where the Buddha said, well, I teach us suffering and the end of suffering. And some people say, well, that's not the case. He also teaches about levels of rebirth and all kinds of other things, teaches about karma. Well, of course, all of these things are relevant to the question of suffering. As he said, birth is suffering. Now, if there's only one birth and you've already had it, then there wouldn't be any reason to talk about it. But the thing is, we'd keep on taking birth. And there are all kinds of levels we can go to, and some of them are pretty horrendous. Some of them are pretty good, but they don't last forever. 
And it's good to know this. It's good motivation for the practice. The Buddha said, when you realize that all beings everywhere, no matter what level they're on, they're subject to aging, illness, and death. And when you think about that, no matter where you go, whatever level in the cosmos, there's going to be aging, illness, and death. In some places it's more subtle, in some places it's more obvious, but it's always going to be there. And the Buddha says, when you reflect on this, that gives rise to the path. In other words, the sense of sangwega comes, realizing that you really do want to get out of all this, no matter how good it is. So when you see someone, even here, just on the human level, living a really comfortable life, lots of wealth, you don't get jealous for them. You don't say, well, gee, I wish I could have that. You realize that even if you had that, there'd still be suffering. So everything the Buddha taught is relevant to the question of what's, what is suffering, what's causing it, and what you can do to put an end to it. And if you see each of the teachings as something that plays a role in answering these questions, then you understand what those teachings are for. The Buddha didn't set out a cosmology just for the sake of having a cosmology. He didn't analyze craving just for because it was interesting. And the analysis is there to help you understand what's going on in your mind right now. The worldview is there to spur you on to realize you've got to get out of worlds entirely. So that's the motivation to take the teachings and really take them to heart. Seeing how they apply specifically to this big problem inside you the suffering you're causing for yourself. Because if we didn't cause suffering for ourselves, we wouldn't be causing suffering for others. We wouldn't be oppressing others. Because we live in a world where everybody has to eat living beings of some kind, even if it's just plants. But we have to depend on the labor of the farmers who plant the plants. And farming is not a pleasant occupation. It's not an easy occupation. And so you realize this world that we live in is just eating, eating, eating. This is what defines us. We feed both physically and mentally. And the question is, is there a way out? When you think in those terms, that gives rise to dispassion. And that leads to the fourth factor, practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. As the texts say, that means practicing for the sake of dispassion. It also means bending yourself to the Dharma, not bending the Dharma to fit your, your likes and dislikes. You realize that the Dharma places demands. Those four noble truths have duties. And some of them involve quite a lot of work. And you're willing to put in the effort because you want something better than just another world to go to. So you use your understanding of the right view <clears throat> and you apply it to the mind, trying to develop the concentration, the mindfulness, all the other factors you need so that you can really see into the mind clearly. Use your right view to look at all the other views that would pull you away, and you learn how to take them apart. Anything that would pull you off the path, you learn to see that this is inconstant, stressful, not self, not worthy of claiming. So you put all the things that would take you off the path and put them aside. The real trick is it comes to the point where you have to put the path aside. Even for stream entry, there has to be a moment where you just drop everything. 
Ananda Bindiga, who was a treasurer in Sawati, and a very busy man, but he be had become a stream editor. One time was visiting a group of adherents of other sects, and they wanted to know from him, what does the Buddha teach? They asked him what the Buddha's views were. And here he was, a stream editor, but he said, you know, I really didn't know the entirety of the Buddha's views. Well, how about the monks? What about them? What are their views? Well, I don't know the entirety of their views either. Well, how about you? What are your views? So I'll be happy to tell you my views, but first you tell me yours. And so they go down the list of all the big issues that day. So the world is eternal. The world is not eternal. It's finite. It's infinite. The body and the life force are the same thing. There's something separate. An awakened person after death either exists or doesn't exist, or both or neither. Those are the hot issues of the day. And then Nabindika points out that if you hold on to any of those things, those things are inconstant, stressful, put together, fabricated. And therefore, if you hold on to them, you're going to hold on to stress. So then I ask him, well, what's your view? He says, I see that whatever is fabricated is worthy of seeing as not me, not mine. He said, in that case, then you're holding that view and you're holding on to stress. And he said, no. I use that view to take other views apart and also to take it apart. The right view is the only view that can transcend itself in this way. And it's in transcending the path that you attain stream entry. The path itself is what gets you there. And then you have to put it aside. Even though you hold on to it for the time being, there does come a point where you have to let it go. But you let it go, not because it's failed you, but because it's served you well. The Buddha's image, of course, is of the raft going across the river. You need the raft to get across the river, but when you're on the other side, then you can put it aside. You don't have to carry it around in your head. So these are things that are worth thinking about, regardless of whether you're thinking about practicing for the sake of stream entry or not. You're practicing to get the mind in good shape. Well, it needs these four qualities associated with the right people so that you can hear the true Dharma and get good examples for how the Dharma is lived. And then use appropriate attention to apply it to your big problem in life as the suffering you're causing yourself. And you're thorough in how you do this. You realize that you really do want to put an end to, to suffering. You really do want to find a happiness that's secure. And so you're careful not to fall for anything less. That's the part that often makes it hard, because it's so easy to fall for other things. You see, I've got a nice practice. It makes me calm, keeps me from going crazy in this crazy world. And a lot of people will stop right there. It's the people who realize that there's more, there's better, and I don't want to settle for second best. Those are the people who go far. And of course, this is a choice that we make. But here the Buddha is giving you the, the tools for making a good choice.